All right. Okay, folks, it's time to start. So this is Physics 137B. Um, you guys, um, I'm hoping you guys can hear me and see the screen okay. Uh, if you cannot, let me know. Um, uh, my name is Professor Cromie. Um, and um, uh, welcome to Physics 137B. I hope that you guys got this uh, syllabus I set out. Um, so, uh, it, one thing is I, uh, when you guys like, if you guys raise your hands, I, I don't like notice that when I'm doing the lecture. And so, uh, if you have a question, just speak up, just, just, uh, you know, unmute yourself and then just say, Hey, 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 <laughs> I have a question and yell up. You know, I know there's like a bunch of you. I don't know how many there are of you 68 as of now. Uh, so that's a lot of people, but just do it anyways. We'll see how it goes. Uh, I'm not good at like noticing the little hand raising thing. So just shout out and that, that's perfectly fine. It's okay to interrupt me. That's perfectly fine. It's even welcome sometimes sort of breaks the, you know, breaks the monotony a little bit to be interrupted. So, um, okay. Uh, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to go over the syllabus. Um, I'm going to do, do, and then I'm going to jump into physics and I'm going to try to do like some review stuff. And then I'm going to do a little bit of, a little bit of new stuff <clears throat> um, just to kind of, you know, get you, get you going again, you know, back, back into physics, uh, back into quantum mechanics. Okay. But let's do, let's do the, uh, the syllabus a little bit right now. Um, and first, let me just ask, uh, so are you hearing me? Okay. Somebody say yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yep. yeah. Good. Okay. One of the things I like to do is I like to ask questions of the class and then I like you to answer me. And it works like in a real class because then I can like look at you in the eye and there's like more of an you know, emotional connection. But on Zoom, it doesn't work quite as well. But I do it anyways because I don't know what else to do because uh, just like my style. Uh, so I will ask you questions. And then I want you just to shout out the answer and don't raise your hand. Just, just, just say, shout it out, you know, and, and it's perfectly fine to do that. Um, uh, and I want you to do that in fact. Okay. So, uh, all right. Uh, so uh, here's the syllabus, the class time, you guys know, the lectures will start at, you know, usual Berkeley time. Uh, I'm going to post the lectures to, uh, my, my Google Drive and I'll send you the link to that and I, so you can like download a big video if you want or or I'm going to post them also to my YouTube channel so you can just watch them on YouTube. Um, I, I've heard people say that they like to you know speed it up a little bit. Well you guys have already been doing this for a while so you you have your own way of doing it. Um, let's see. Um, my office hours will be right after class so uh, I have to, I'll have to stop the Zoom meeting uh, to end, to get it to record because of the recording uh, software. But then what I'll do is I'll start it back up. I'll start the meeting back up again. Uh, hopefully that won't screw up the, the recording part. I've never done that, but I'm hoping it'll work okay. So after the class is over, I will end the, I will end the Zoom meeting, but then I'll start the Zoom meeting back up again. And then you can come back on if you want to go to office hours. Um, and that, and I'll do that each after each class, but I got to stop it to get the recording. Cause I, I don't think I want to record the office hour. Um, that, uh, that would make it too big. Um, okay. Okay. Let's see. The TA is Carl Marth. Uh, here's his contact information. The textbook is, um, in introduction to quantum mechanics, third edition by, by Griffiths. Uh, but I, I think I'm also. Uh, when I give the homework, I think I give the homework also, I, I will give the homework for other editions too. Like if you use a second edition, that's okay. Um, um, I don't know, maybe, you know, I'm assuming that a bunch of you used Griffiths last semester, um, but uh, a lot of you probably did not. And some of you didn't even take quantum mechanics last semester. You took it a year ago or two years ago. So, you know, I know there's a, a wide variety of people and but this, this book tends, is a pretty good book. Uh, the third edition, he's corrected a lot of the mistakes from earlier editions and 
it's a pretty good book. This guy, David Griffiths, is pretty, uh, he's, he's very pedagogically skilled. He's a good teacher. And so his, I like his textbook, even though it's not perfect. Um, the grading for this class will be, there'll be an in-class midterm, although, you know, we'll do like some Zoom thing, you know, usually in the past, I like have a 24 hour window and we'll, we'll figure out the logistics. But it worked okay in the past, so I don't think it'll be a big deal. So we have a uh, we have a, a midterm, and we have a final, uh, and then we have homework. Uh, and the the homework, you know, is worth approximately the same as the midterm. So it's important, you know, to do the homework. The homework policy is that every Tuesday, and today is Tuesday. I I will the first time we meet, you know, the first day of class each week. I I will give the the GSI. The homework assignment and he will post it on the on the course website it should be the b course website uh, and then the homework will be due the following week so uh i give it on tuesday but then i it's due on friday of the next week and then but next week i'll give it another homework on tuesday so you see there's like this intersecting thing where the homework is due later and then you'll at one point you'll get the new homework and you'll still have the old homework so that's a little bit of a funny thing but i I do that so that you have longer time to do the homework. I give you the homework on Tuesday. It's due Friday of the next of the following week, Friday at midnight. And that way it gives you the illusion of, that you have more time. Um, so um, uh, in terms of the homework um, uh, policy, um, uh, the homework will be turned. I want you to turn in the homework using grade scope. Um, uh, and so that's something for you to, you know, to do with the TA, the, the, the GSI, he will, he can, you know, work, he'll, he will work those details out with you. Um, um, the homework is, will be due Friday at midnight, but if you have some extenuating circumstance, then uh, it is possible for having to have a short homework extension, but you have to, what to do that, you have to make the request of the GSI and, and give the, re, the GSI the reason why you want your extension and you can, you know, we can have a short extension, but not, not too long. Um, and if, if, if that doesn't work for you, then um, there's other possibilities, then you should talk to me. Like if you absolutely can't do the homework, but you have a really good reason, you know, you're sick or, you know, whatever, then talk to me and in, in about dropping the homework. I do not just automatically drop the lowest homework. That's, I just don't do that. But if you have some reason why you can't do homework and there are many legitimate reasons as you all know then just tell me and you know and and then i will then i will uh, drop that homework you know if, if, if you have a, a reasonable excuse and that and that's important because you know you don't want to start getting zeros on your homework it really will mess up your grade so please stay on the homework um it's like you know for students you, you know you cannot control the test you know the tests come and there's nothing you can do about that and you can't control what's on the test but the one thing you do have the most control over is homework so try to exert some control over that um uh okay so uh the course content will be um well here it is identical particles many body part many body systems addition of angular momentum uh and then uh the big the big uh, topic for this class, the biggest, I mean, there are all these topics are big topics, but the most important topic, in my opinion, is the perturbation theory. Uh, we'll be doing a lot of, uh, well, it's like the approximation methods. Uh, the point of, in quantum, a big point of quantum mechanics that you don't know, that you did not know until now, unless you have already taken quantum mechanics, but most of you did not know until this moment that uh, a big part of quantum mechanics, like last semester, you, you learned like the, the basics of quantum mechanics and you learned all these problems that you can solve. Some harmonic oscillator, hydrogen, pro hydrogen atom, free particle, particle in a box. It's so exciting because you can solve them and solve the Schrodinger equation. But the, the, little, the little nasty trick that nobody told you is that those are the only problems that can be solved. You learned them all last semester. <laughs> they can, nothing else can be solved in quantum mechanics because it's just too hard. And so quantum, it's just, you know, solving the Schrodinger equation and doing quantum mechanics correctly is too hard. And so, and so people have invented a bunch of approximation methods. And so out in the real world, for people who actually use quantum mechanics every day to do real physics, you know, out in the real world, and I'm one of those people, then, uh, and you also will be, you might be one of those people if you, if you want to be, you know, and 
Um, and, um, and, and for those people, using quantum mechanics involves using approximation methods. You know, we're, we're always approximating, 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 we're, because we're always approximating because just solving the Schrodinger equation correctly is impossible for real physical systems typically. I mean, unless your physical system is literally a perfect, you know, simple harmonic oscillator, <laughs> then you can solve it, but that's usually not the case. Usually there's all kinds of other shit going on, you know, and so you can't, you can't solve it all, so you have to approximate. And so today, uh, in this class, we're going to do a lot of approximation methods, and that and that is is very important because that's how real people actually do quantum mechanics is through these approximation methods. And I'm I, I know I'm going on and on about this sort of a little too long, but the reason I'm doing it is because I want to give you a sense of the importance of these approximation methods because they're these approximation methods are not they're not. It's more than you think because these approximation methods are not just ways to solve the Schrodinger equation, although they are that, but they are also, they also give you ways to think about the Schrodinger equation. These approximation methods actually give you a new type of intuition for quantum mechanics. And so people out in the real world doing quantum mechanics, the intuition that we have for quantum mechanics is actually uh, created by these approximation methods. So they have like a whole intuition of their own. So you get insight into quantum mechanics from the approximation method. And that is a little bit weird and maybe you haven't thought of it like that before, but, but th that's the truth. So that's why these approximation methods are, they're not just mathematical tricks, although they are mathematical tricks, but they are more than that. They are ways to actually think about quantum mechanics. And so that's I want to emphasize that at the beginning. Okay, so that's really important. Uh, so these, so for these uh, approximation methods, we'll be doing perturbation theory, var variational principle, WKB, time-dependent perturbation theory. So we'll do all that, uh, and then we'll do uh, we'll do some scattering. Uh, I like scattering. We'll do some scattering at the end, uh, and then we'll do uh, advanced topics, time permitting. Uh, I, I have done this course. I've taught this course before, you know, a bunch of times. And so I kind of have a sense of how much time will, will be at the end, usually depending on nuances. Uh, but usually there's about one to two lectures left at the end. Uh, everything gets covered and there's like one or maybe two less lectures left. And then I will just talk about sort of random stuff at the end. Uh, usually what people like is to talk about is uh, I have some lectures on the Dirac equation that I like to give because the Dirac equation explains the origin of spin, which is kind of cool and it's really neat. And so I usually give one or two lectures on the Dirac equation at the end. But if you want me to lecture about something else, then I might do that, <laughs> depending on how many of you, you know, want me to do that and we could have a vote. And you know, like if you wanted me to talk about uh, Berry phase or Landau levels or something different, then I would, uh, but uh, usually I do the Dirac equation, which most people think is, is pretty cool. And you get a lot of bang for your buck for that with that. Okay, now in terms of books, you want to use other books in this course. Um, there is no great, one great book, although, you know, Griffith's book, I think is the most popular these days, introductory quantum mechanics book, but everybody doesn't agree it's the best one. And there is no one great book. So I really recommend heavily and uh, strongly that you get other books it, you know and i and i know that you know you're not all wealthy and don't have tons of money but regardless uh go get more books you know go to go to a, i don't know go to garage sales uh go to go to used bookstores you know there are used books that don't cost that much uh, i suggest that you really try to get your hands on some other books because it's really convenient to have m more than one book so that you can kind of see how other people do it uh, because the topics in quantum mechanics are really funny in the sense that everybody approaches them differently. And so we could be talking about some topic like, you know, degenerate perturbation theory and what, whatever uh, Griffith says in his book might make no sense to you at all. But then you might go and get the book by Bransden and Joachim or Leboff or um, Cohen and Tanuji. And then you might read some other book and, and then suddenly it will click, click, and then everything will make sense because the point is that everyone explains things differently. And one explanation for one person is gobbledygook, but for the other person, that's like the perfect explanation. And you don't know which is the right one. So, you know, you, you, it's really useful to have multiple books. Um, 
but but regardless of all these books, I mean, I, I will cover everything in class and my lectures will be mostly taken out of Griffiths. I steal stuff from Griffiths, but, but these lectures that I've made for this course are also, I take stuff from other books, you know, so I've taken little bits and pieces from many, many books and that's how I've made my lectures, although they mostly follow Griffiths. <clears throat> Uh, okay, here's a list of the topics. I'm not going to go over that. Uh, you guys can just look at it yourself. Um, let's see. Um, okay, so that's all I want to say about the syllabus. Uh, am I coming through okay, guys? You can hear me still? Not? Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Uh, all right, all right. So now we're going to dive into the um, uh, uh, topic. And so I'm going to stop sharing. Oh, uh, that's cute. Uh, five minutes. Uh, so, uh, Professor? yeah. Uh, somebody asked uh, if there's a piazza form for this class. Oh, yeah, we always do. How do you say it? Piazza, piazza, piazza. Uh, How do you say it? People say it differently. I, I think <laughs> it's piazza, but I don't know. They should just call it pizza. That'd be easier. Um, so, uh, piazza, yeah. So, there, yeah, there's always a piazza. I don't set it up. I don't know how it works, but somehow there always seems to be a piazza that just sort of pops into existence. Uh, it's like a mystery to me, but it always seems to happen. So yeah, there, there should be one. And maybe you could talk to, to the GSI and figure out how to set it up. I have no idea how it works, but it always seems to just kind of pop into existence. And that's a, I think that's a good thing. And I do respond you know, to the piazza questions. Uh, okay. Um, okay, so what I'm gonna do now is uh, let's see. I'm gonna get try to get my my iPad to work. Come on, work. I gotta do this little thing to make it work. <sighs> Yay! I think it's working. Um, okay, now I have my iPad working. So. Okay, so you guys can see that okay, I assume. Is that, that right? Um, yeah. Okay, yeah. Fine. good. Okay, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna do some, um, um, I'm gonna do some spin review. And then I'm gonna start the new, then I'm gonna do like sort of overall uh, quantum mechanics review, just a wee bit. And then I'm gonna do um, the new topic, which it should be new for all of, for most of you, for, you know, for all of you, except for those who have taken other quantum mechanics courses, uh, many body um, states. Like how do you deal with many body states in quantum mechanics? Uh, so this is the plan for, for the rest of this lecture. So, uh, Let's start with this. Yeah. Uh, just a quick question. Will you also be posting these whiteboard notes? Yeah, I will. So what I'm gonna post is, I'm using a software on my iPad called Notebook. And so what I will do is I will post three things. One will be this video that's being recorded. Second will be this notebook file that I'm making right now using the notebook software, some weird notebook for file format that you can use if you have notebook. But third, I will print out this whiteboard thing that I'm making using a P into a PDF file. And I will also post the PDF. So if you don't have the notebook software, you can still look at these notes via the PDF. Okay, so I'll, I'll post all three of those things. Uh, okay, thank you. All right. Um, Okay, so for the spin review, um, what I uh, will do now is th there's always a little bit of uh, the question is always how to uh, go from your last course to this course, because the assumption is that you all, you know, have learned the basics of quantum mechanics and now we're learning, you know, the next level of quantum mechanics. And, but the question is how to make a, uh, uh, an elegant uh, transition from your last course to this course. And so uh, the problem that I have faced is that often some people haven't learned spin. And so I'm not going to like embarrass anybody by saying, you know, who hasn't learned spin, <laughs> you know, but I'm assuming that some of you out there have not learned spin, at least that, you know, unless everything has changed, you know, as the years go by, uh, 
the topics that are covered in the, the first and second semester of quantum mechanics sort of starts evolving, you know, it's different. So uh, I just want to make sure that everyone has learned spin because spin is, you know, going to be just, I'm a, basically, I'm assuming that you guys all have learned the basics of quantum mechanics. You understand the Schrodinger equation, what a Hamiltonian is, time dependence. I'm assuming you know all this stuff and, and, and I'm assuming you know spin. But, uh, but I think that some of you might not have learned spin. And so I'm going to do a quick spin review. And this spin review is not meant to teach you spin, but it's meant to sort of show you, it's meant to review. Like it's basically I'm saying, you know, this is what I expect you to understand. So if, if what I'm saying is just like a bunch of gobbledygook, and you've never seen it before, that means you don't know spin. <laughs> and so then go learn spin, go learn spin, okay? It, you know. It's just something you got to do. Go go read the chapter on spin, and it's it's not you know it's not so hard, but it's not so easy either. You gotta, but you just gotta you know power through it uh, and learn spin. <laughs> okay, so we'll do spin first. Just sort of a brief review. Um, okay, um, so let's talk about that. Uh, so let's talk about spin. Um, okay, so. Um, so here's a thing, here's a fact. Elementary particles have spin. And spin, what spin is, and I'm just gonna kind of, I'm doing this kind of fast, you know, because this is meant to be a review of something you've already learned, but I just wanna remind you of the things you're supposed to know about spin. So spin is an intrinsic angular momentum. Intrinsic angular momentum and it's a pretty you know the first time you see it it's pretty conf pretty weird and confusing i mean i certainly as an i remember you know i took this course in 1983 that's when i took the course that you're taking right now and so i remember it even though it was so long ago and i remember being really confused by spin so i know it's not easy the first time you see it because it's just a weird concept you know what the hell is intrinsic angular momentum well, I'm not gonna get caught up in all the philosophical nuances of intrinsic angular momentum. It is, it is what it is. Particles have it, you know, it's something they have. And a way to think about it is that particles, you guys are all used to like normal angular momentum, you know, when something is spinning, it has angular momentum, you know, it's like spinning. Like this is meant to be like a sphere that's, you know, spinning with some ang uh, or some uh, angular velocity, you know, uh, and then it then it has angular momentum, and you guys all know about you know orbital angular momentum. In and and so in orbital angular momentum, you know you have L equals R cross P, and you guys did all these. Uh, um, in quantum mechanics, we you guys did all the quantum mechanics of orbital angular momentum and i'm not going to go over that because i know that you learned that for sure everybody learns that in the first semester but you guys learned that from the commutator relations you learn lx ly equals um i h bar lz etc so from the and from the commutators then you learned all the quantum mechanics of orbital angular momentum and you went through it, you know, raising operators, lowering operators, all that stuff. And and particles have, and 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 then you realize that particles have orbital angular momentum. But and so the idea of of spin is it's really the same thing. Spin, the way we define spin is that we say that um, we 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 postulate, we say that we, we just basically say that there is an observable called spin. And it's an intrinsic angular momentum, and it's an operator, like like every observable in quantum mechanics, it's an operator. I put a little hat over it to, to indicate that it's an operator. And it's a because it's an angular momentum, it's a vector. So it has an x component, it has a y component, it has a z component. Um, and um, and the way we and basically the way we define its properties is that. We can, def quant from a quantum mechanics point of view, we can define its properties from, in the same way, basically, the, all the properties of, of angular momentum are, are come out of the commutator relationships. And so once you've defined the commutator, then everything falls from that. 
And so uh, we basically, what we do is we copy the form of orbital angle momentum and we just postulate that the commutator relations for the X, Y, and Z components of spin are the same as for orbital angle momentum. So this is really just a, a postulate. Um, and so we, uh, we, so we just postulate this, um, or, or maybe, the, maybe it's an ansatz. I sometimes forget the difference between ansatz and postulate, uh, but it's, it's that. We, it's an assumption, that's the word I should use. So we just make these assumptions. Um, and so once you've made these assumptions, then all the properties of orbital ang of angle momentum fall from these two from these commutators, um, and um, and I know you all did this last semester. At least you did it. I know you did it for orbital, and probably most of you did it for spin also. But I, I'm just not sure if you did or not. That's why I'm doing this. And so since um, we have uh, so basically since um, we have this commutator, the s squared and the SZ have a commute, then what happens is uh, I can define uh, simultaneous eigenvalues of those two operators, S squared and SZ. And so I will then define them. So the uh, so I will define the simultaneous eigenstates of S squared and SZ. And you know this is pretty fast. You know, it's like a fast way to learn spin. So I'm, you know, this is just review. Uh, but the simultaneous eigenstates, I can define them in this bra or ket form, uh, formulation. So that's a ket. That's an eigenstate. And so to define an eigenstate, that means that the operator times the eigenstate uh, is equal to a constant times the eigenstate. Some constant times the eigenstate. And so if I hit the uh, spin eigenstate with the S squared operator, I get an eigenvalue. Can somebody tell me what that eigenvalue is? The eigenvalue is in front. The op so it's, I, I'm going operator times eigenstate is equal to a constant times the eigenstate. What is the constant? Now I'm asking. Uh, 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 the square root of L times L plus one. Uh, ah, S times the S plus one, I guess. S times the S plus one. Ah, yeah, exactly. Good. S times S plus one. And what are the units of S squared? It's an angle momentum. What are the units? What determines the units? Because there's a factor that's missing here. H bar. Exactly. The units of angle momentum is H bar. And so this is S squared. So what goes in front? H bar, H -bar squared. squared. Perfect. That's exactly right. Uh, and of course, these S's, the, the constant S, which we often call the eigenvalue, although it's, it's a little confusing because sometimes we say S is the eigenvalue, but actually H bar squared times S times S plus one is the eigenvalue. But when people talk, we just, the words we use, we often say S is the eigenvalue. It's just a nomenclature. Slight inconsistency, but people do it. So S, the, the, uh, I guess I could call it the, uh, the index or the, I, the, I'll just say eigenvalue, uh, e is N over two, where N is an integer. So S can be a half integer. Now that are already tells you that there's something funny about spin because orbital angle momentum, the, um, the magnitude L squared of the orbital angle momentum, uh, the, the, uh, the value L can only be an integer. Whereas for spin, it can be a half integer. And that's because it ha there's no, there, it has nothing to do with real space. There's no real space aspect to spin. It has nothing to do with real space. There's no, <laughs> there's no actual spinning. Okay, there's no spinning. And that's why it's so confusing because you, you, it, it's sort of slippery con concept because there's no actual thing spinning and yet it behaves as though it's spinning. That's why it's such such a funny thing. But I would just say, when it comes to spin, I would suggest for each of you that you, when you think of spin, think of the object, like the electron that has spin, think of it as actually spinning on its axis, axis with some angular momentum or some angular velocity, because 
the, the quantum mechanics of spin is really almost, is essentially uh, almost identical to the quantum mechanics of the object if it were literally spinning. But the, the only difference is that it, you can have half integer values of spin, whereas an object that's literally spinning, you cannot have the half integer values. Um, uh, okay, and then, and then of course, there's the S, uh, it's a simultaneous eigenstate of S squared and SZ. Um, and so um, uh, I have now, a, uh, if I hit it with this operator, then I, I also get a constant times the eigenstate. What's the constant now? Somebody tell me. Is it H bar M? Yes, perfect. And M can equal, well, it's a range. It can go from plus something to minus something. What's the highest value? Uh, plus N over two and then, or plus yeah. I guess S and then minus S. Exactly, S to minus S. And, and everything in between, S minus one, S minus two, et cetera. That's right. Uh, that's what it can be. Let's erase that. Okay, so, um, all right. So there's a, so there's a two S plus one states here that have the same uh, S value. Okay, uh, and so then we so then we can have different s values, and so uh, different particles can have different s values. Um, for example, what's the spin of uh, let's think of a particle? What's the spin of well? What's the spin of an electron? One half. One half. Exactly. Um, what's the spin of a photon? One. One. Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, hi. So the, I remember that like s squared is the total spin angular momentum, and sc is like the z component. What yeah. are like the eigen values s times s plus one and m represent because m kind of makes sense but s times s plus one is a little weird well it is weird um and so the way to think about it is kind of like this i mean it's like um okay in your mind you can picture the particle spinning even though it's not it's useful it's a useful uh on uh, mnemonic, mnemonic, it's a useful thing, you know, to help you think about, to, to help create a framework for understanding. So, so if the object is spinning, then uh, uh, what I can do is I can um, uh, draw, you know, my, um, I can draw my, uh, this would be say SX, SY, SZ. So I can draw, you know, some spin. So this is like the angular, you know, the angular momentum space. And so my total, so if this is my total angular momentum, then this is the spin of my particle. That arrow that I just drew, because it's a vector, it's an angular momentum. Uh, and so then in your mind, you should picture this is, you know, h bar squared s times s plus one. It's just the length of this vector squared, right? So the length of that vector is going to be the square root of that. that that's the most useful way for you to uh, visualize in your mind the, uh, you know, what that S is. It's just the magnitude of, of the angle momentum. Because the particle, think of the particle as spinning on its own axis, and h bar squared times s times s plus 1 is just telling you how fast is it spinning on its axis. Okay? It's like electrons are spinning fast enough to give s equals 1, s equals 1 half, and Photons are spinning a little faster to give S equals one. That's like a way to think about it, even though that's bullshit. <laughs> it's not true, but it's useful. It's sort of like a nice way to picture it in your mind. Um, and then, and then, of course, you have this funny, funny thing that the uh, the spin is quantized. Like it can go click, 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 click. So 
this would be, uh, you know, m equals one, m equals two, m equals three. So it's clicking, you know, that it, 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 it can only be in these, uh, these uh, uh, discrete components. I'll say it clicks. Because uh, S sub Z is quantized. Okay, but this is a picture that should be familiar to you from orbital angular momentum. So everything for spin is the same as orbital angular momentum. So everything I'm saying about spin is just the same as what I would say for orbital angular momentum. <laughs> Except for orbital angular momentum, the particle is literally spinning in real space. You know, orbital angular momentum corresponds to a particle that is literally, you know, spinning, <laughs> whereas spin is not spinning. So, uh, but it behaves as though it is. And it's actually, just such a simple concept. It's so simple. It's there's nothing more to it than what I just said. But it's like it's like such a slippery concept that you you know you can sit there and just you know get all confused about it, even though it's so it's one of those things. It's so simple and yet it's very confusing too. Okay, um, so uh, let's see. Uh, let's talk about uh, eigenstates. So so for so you see of it you know you're gonna have and and. And a way to think about this, this value S is that it doesn't change. S doesn't change for a, for a, a, for a particle. So the, the, thing, the way to think about it is that the value of S is like stamped on the particle. So every different particle has an intrinsic uh, uh, eigenvalue S. And that is an intrinsic part of that particle. It doesn't change. It's stamped. It's like the particle is stamped. Boom, you're stamped. You know, your S equals one. Nothing you can do about it. You're done. If you're a photon, your S equals one. If you're an electron, your S equals one half. Every, you know, it doesn't change. Uh, but uh, M can change. Right? Because you can be, you can be, for example, spin up or you can be spin down. It it changes. Um, and so uh, let's consider. Um, electrons, and the electron is my favorite particle. Consider electrons, um, and they have s equals one half. And I, I love electrons because I'm a condensed matter experimentalist. I should have said this at the beginning. That's where I'm coming from. I'm on that because anyone who's going to teach quantum mechanics or any course in physics is going to be completely influenced by their topic of research. So I'm a condensed matter experimentalist. I study materials. I study crystals and surfaces and atoms and molecules, you know, stuff, you know, condensed matter that you can hold in your hand. Uh, and so that influences how I think and what I think and what I consider to be important. So, uh, so I will consider some things to be important and some things to not be important based on my personal idiosyncratic experience. So I'm going to teach this class very different than, for example, like I think the other section of 137B is taught by Marjorie Olmsted. Now she's a high energy experimentalist. So she does particles, you know, she goes to CERN and smashes particles together, you know, uh, whereas I don't, I don't do that. I study like crystals in my laboratory, you know, and I like might shine light on a crystal, uh, but, it, but it's very different. So, uh, so uh, I, so, so there are certain topics in quantum mechanics that I think are very important and other topics that I think are very unimportant. And that's based on my own experience and that's how I'm going to teach this class. But it's but I'm telling you that now because, you know, there might be some some aspects of quantum mechanics that I think that I'm telling you are unimportant, and yet you might go out and in your own experience, those might end up being the most important things of all, and then you'll be mad at me. So I'm just saying, don't be mad at me. Just you know, realize that I'm giving you you know I'm teaching you an idiosyncratic course, like I'm teaching you quantum mechanics that I think is important. And, and, and I think that I think that's the way to do it because otherwise, you know, it, I don't want to be teaching things that I think are boring and stupid and not not important, even though they might be very important to somebody else. Uh, but that's how I'm teaching this class. <clears throat> uh, okay, so so in my world, electrons are the most important particle because in condensed matter physics, it's all about electrons. All right, so we care about electrons. We don't care about quarks. You know, uh, we don't care about muons, but we really care about electrons. Uh, okay, so electrons have s equals one half, 
And so that means that this uh, state uh, that they have, um, that means that their, uh, their spin eigenstates, spin eigenstates, can be written as, uh, and these spin eigenstates are, you know, SM. That means that the that the SM are going to be. Uh, there's only going to be. Well, I'll ask you, how many are there? How many spin eigenstates are there for the electron? Uh, two. That's right. That's right. Because the S component can be one half. But the M component can be either plus one half or it can be minus one half, right? So I got these two states. Uh, and so what we sometimes do is we'll say, we'll, we'll name them, we'll call one. So first I just wanna say, you know, there's only two states. So this is a, a two dimensional uh, Hilbert space. So there's there's only these two states that the spin can have that an electron can have in terms of spin. It can be either up or down, and but it could also be uh, uh, linear combinations of that. So we'll we'll talk about that in a moment. But let's just just notice that uh, sometimes people call them plus will be one half, one half, uh, and and sometimes we'll call the other one minus one half minus one half, or sometimes we'll just call it up. And sometimes we'll just call this one down. And because the point is, is that nobody ever says that the spin eigenstate of this, the eigenstate of a spin is, you know, uh, one half. Nobody likes to say that the eigenstate is one half minus one half is the eigenstate. You know, no, nobody says that. What people say instead, they'll just say, well, my, my spin eigenstate uh, chi is up. And, and it's, it's up to you to know that, that when I do this little up, I really mean, um, or I guess I should have said down in this case. Let's say down. It, and, when I say, and when I say down, it's up to you to know that uh, what I'm really talking about is this, okay? So, but, but people just don't like to, you know, just too much writing. Um, yeah, I have a question. I have a question. So, is that up and down relative to like the angular momentum of like the atom? Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, you 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 pick a z component. You 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 have to. I'm sorry. You pick a. You have to pick a, an axis, a coordinate system. Basically, pick a coordinate system and stick with it. <laughs> And then, and then when you write down the eigenstates of spin, then you can write them in terms of the Z component of spin in that coordinate system. That, that's a convention. Um, you, you, instead, you could, have, you could choose, choose the X, you could choose to write them in the X uh, coordinate as eigenstates of, of SX. All right, you, you, you can just choose it however you want. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, uh, let's see. So, so let's do, because I mean, here's the thing, you know, like this, this, the spin, the spin is, you know, SXI plus SYJ uh, plus SZK. And, and the point is, is that S squared commutes only with, it commutes with SZ, but it also commutes with SX. It also commutes with SY. So I could pick, it, but the point is, is that, but the SX and the SY don't commute and the, and the SY and the SZ don't commute. And basically none, none of the individual components commute. So to write down the eigenstate, I can pick, so my eigenstate can be an eigenstate of S squared and one other guy, okay? When I write the eigenstate of spin, I can pick the simultaneous eigenstate. It can be a simultaneous eigenstate of S squared and only one component, 
because S squared will commute with any of them, but they don't commute with each other. So I could not have, I could not have it be a simultaneous eigenvalue of S squared and two components because they don't commute, right? So I, it's S squared and one component. So, so we can only pick one component. So which will it be? Will it be X? Will it be Y? Or will it be Z? In terms of the mathematics of spin, it doesn't matter. You could pick any one of them and the math would all work out. But it's simply conventional to pick Z because you got to pick one, why not Z, you know? So it's just uh, conventional to pick Z, but you don't have to. All right, so, uh, all right. <clears throat> okay, so it's a two-dimensional Hilbert space. And, um, and so what we can do, since it's a, since we have two for, for, so for S equals one half, we have two eigenstates um, and we'll call them say, you know, plus, minus or well, let's call them actually out in the real world i think people tend to use up and down more than plus minus but i see both a lot so up and down is more, most common so we, we have the states up and down uh and so because this is a 2d hilbert space meaning that there's only two possibilities up or down those are the eigenstates um then we can write any state chi arbitrary state can be written as a arbitrary linear superposition of these two dimensional eigenstates. So I could write it like this, A up plus B down, where for normalization, I have to have A squared, well, A and B can be complex numbers, but I have to have A squared plus B squared equals what? Now I'm asking you a question. One? Yes, for normalization. That's right. And so you see that this is my uh, arbitrary spin state, arbitrary spin state. It's a vector in a 2D Hilbert space. Because Hilbert space is, because the thing is Hilbert space it's just vector space. Hilbert space equals vector space. And I just, and this is all just, this is all just linear algebra, you know? So when I say Hilbert space, I mean just, it's just linear algebra. And so I'm just saying, and so I hope that you guys have learned linear algebra because I, you know, the language of quantum mechanics is the language of linear algebra. So whenever, someone speaks about quantum mechanics or tries to speak and you know talk about quantum mechanics which i'm trying to do because i'm you know teaching this class then the language i use is the language of linear algebra because quantum mechanics is linear algebra and so i'm hoping that you've learned linear algebra if you have not please go learn linear algebra because you will never understand quantum mechanics unless you understand linear algebra because the language of quantum mechanics is literally the language of linear algebra it's not it's not like quantum mechanics is sort of like linear algebra or analogous to it. It literally is linear algebra. Okay, so when I talk about a ket, so you know, a ket, that's that's a vector, you know, it's a vector in a in a vector space. It's a vector in a vector space, you know, that follows all the rules of linear algebra. But the but for quantum mechanics, we just happen to call the vector space Hilbert space. Just because I don't know why because it's quantum mechanics. Uh, and so, uh, okay, so I just wanna get that lingo down. Uh, and so since we have two, two bases, so the way to think about it is that for the vector space, you know, you have basis states that span basis states. So now I'm using the language of linear algebra. So if I have a vector space, then I have basis states that span the vector space. And my basis states here are gonna be the states up and down. Those are my basis states. They're the, the basis states that span the Hilbert space, they span the vector space. And so that means that any vector in that vector, any vector in that vector space, which is my spin state, can be written as a linear superposition of the basis states. It's just 
this is just linear algebra. So it's, it's just exactly what you guys all learned in linear algebra. So this is a, okay, so this is a, um, so that, that's an arbitrary spin state. But now why don't we just take the uh, linear algebra um, um, uh, lingo a little further, because since we have a two-dimensional vector space, we can write these as two-dimensional vectors, right? And since there's only two of them, let's, let's give them a name. Why don't we call this one one zero? Because it's a two-dimensional vector space, and we'll call this one zero one. And so an arbitrary vector, an arbitrary spin state for an, for an S equals one half. So remember, we're only talking about S equals one half now. But for an arbitrary spin state of an S equals one half particle, it can be written as A times one zero plus B times one times zero one, where we have uh, A squared plus, for normalization purposes, A squared plus B squared has equals one. The normalization is important because I need to, I need to be able to say that uh, the length that I need to be able to say that the length is one of, of the state, and you guys know that from probability from probability. Um, so that means then that this using the language of linear algebra, then this is going to be a zero plus zero b is equal to a b. So that's a spin state. And this we call the spinner notation. Because a spin, because we can write for an S equals one half particle, we can write down all the spin states in terms of this two dimensional vector space using this two dimensional uh, linear algebra notation. And so in this, in this language, then we can say that um, it's conventional. We, we'll say that the spin operator is uh, S is equal to uh, H bar over two times sigma X I plus, this is just convention, this is just notation, just another way of writing spin. But for, for S equals one half, this is the convention for S equals one half. We like to write the spin operator in this form. And then these are the operators, the X, Y, and Z component and we can find, so we know that each of these operators, say sigma x, is a matrix. And because the spin is a, two, is a, is a vector in a two-dimensional Hilbert space, then the operator that operates on that vector is a matrix. And what is the dimensionality of the matrix? What dimensionality of matrix operates on a two-dimensional vector? Tell me. Two by two matrix? Yeah, it has to, it's a two by two matrix. So all the spin operators for S equals one half are two by two matrices. And so we can calculate, we can figure out what they are by just calculating their components. Like this component is the one, one component, one, two, two, one, two, two. And then we can do the same thing for sigma Y and sigma Z, et cetera. And, and then we can ask, okay, well, what are these guys? Sigma XX, one, one. So then we know that um, Sigma X, well, Sigma X is just equal to uh, SX divided by H bar over two, right? From this definition here. And so um, to find Sigma X, one, one, then I would just take um, up, S X over H bar over two up. So that's state number one and state number one. And then Sigma X one, two is gonna be one S X over H bar over two down, etc. And so you can basically calculate all the, and so these are called the matrix elements because any, any operator in quantum mechanics can be built up by taking the basis states and, and, and sandwiching them on the operator, and then you can build up the matrix. I'm assuming you've all done that. And so if you go through that for these spin operators for S equals one half, then you find out that, S, that sigma X is equal to uh, one, or I'm sorry, zero, one, one, zero, 
and sigma y is equal to zero minus i and i zero and sigma z is equal to one zero zero minus one and these guys have a name what are they called what are they matrices poly matrices yeah these are the spin poly matrices yeah the poly poly matrices Right, these are the poly matrices. And so, and, and um, Sx is equal to h bar over two sigma x and Sy is h bar over two sigma y, etc. Okay, so that's sort of it. I don't, I mean, you know, spin is a big topic and we could just go on and on about it, but that, that's basically, the, that's where I wanna stop for my spin review. Okay, so uh, I don't wanna, you know, cause I think we, that's sort of the, I've introduced the essence of the uh, topic of spin. One thing that we haven't done was to like solve problems, you know, like, you know, what's the time dependence of the spin and what does it do in the magnetic field and how does it resonate? You know, there's like a ton of stuff, but I'm not gonna do that uh, because I just wanna make sure that you understand that, the essence of it. Okay, so now we're, let's, so now we're gonna switch topics and let's go over to, we're gonna start uh, this new topic, which is many body physics, basically the idea is how do you do quantum mechanics of many particles, all right? That's our next big topic, the quantum mechanics of many particles. Um, and I just, and so let's, so now let's just do an, another little bit of review. Like let's review the quantum mechanics of one particle. That's what you learned last semester. Physics 137A was the quantum mechanics of one particle. And now we want to learn the, the quantum mechanics of many particles. And the thing about the quantum mechanics of many particles is that it has sort of, it's really interesting, you know, it has many, many le levels and layers, but at the very uh, essence of it, it can, it's very trivial. Like it's, there's like a very trivial, I mean, totally simple, uh, uh, extrapolation of the, the quantum mechanics of one particle to the quantum mechanics of many particles. And I, I, it's important, I want you to understand the simple one, okay, the simple part, it's important because that's the starting point. But then it turns out that there's all this weird stuff that can happen if you have more than one particle, then you, there's some very interesting uh, things that happen in the quantum mechanics of many particles. Uh, the, uh, if the particles are indistinguishable, then there's some very interesting things that happen and it's really cool, it's neat. Uh, you know, we talk about fermions and bosons and all that. So um, uh, that will all come to play. Uh, but, but first let's do the quantum mechanics of one particle. And so for the quantum mechanics of one particle, you guys know that um, in for one particle, we know that there exists, there exists the wave function, right? And the wave function psi can have, um, and I'm using sort of some maybe sloppy notation, but it can have sort of a, a spatial component times a spin component, okay? So this is space, spin. So my particle can have, my wave function can have some spatial component and it can also have some spin component. And often they're just a, a product. They don't have to be a product. They can be all entangled in some weird complex way, but for this course, let's just think about the simplest thing where they're just a simple product. Uh, and we also know that um, there exists, for quantum mechanics to work, there exists Hamiltonians. Hamiltonian. And the Hamiltonian is just the energy operator, right? Energy operator. And it, it's really just going to be uh, the kinetic energy plus the potential energy. And the, but the potential energy is sort of tricky. It could be a position of, it could be a function of position, but it can also be a function of other things. Like you could have a function of or angle momentum. It could be a function of spin. You know, you can put other things can go into that potential energy. So this is kinetic energy and this is potential energy. Um, Okay, so we got a Hamiltonian, we got a wave function. And then uh, in quantum mechanics, we say there exists um, 
the entire value. There exists there exists a Schrodinger equation. And the Schrodinger equation is that uh, H acting on psi is equal to IH bar DDT uh, psi. And, and that's sort of, you know, that's kind of like the start, the, the, the starting of quantum mechanics. And then you guys know then that um, there exists, I'll just write it one more time and then I'm done. There exists probability because uh, the whole interpretation of quantum mechanics is probabilistic. And so uh, we say that there's a, a probability density And the wave function is always interpreted to interpret it in a probabilistic way. And for the spatial wave function, we will say that the probability is uh, you just square it, psi star psi. And it gives you probability density, the probability per, per, uh, per distance. And that has units of probability per distance. And we know then that there, that you have to have normalization because pro probability does not make any sense unless normalization exists because the total, the sum of all, the probability of all possibilities, the sum of all probabilities for all possibilities is equal to what? Somebody tell me. One. Yes, it has to, otherwise probability has no meaning. <laughs> that is literally the definition of probability. Okay. so. So it probably has to, so you, you can't have probability without normalization, uh, otherwise it has no meaning. Uh, and so then we have uh, uh, the integral from negative infinity to negative infinity of rho of x t dx has to be one, okay? It has to be normalized. And also we noticed that uh, if we have, and there's other little nuances as well, we noticed that um, the um, eigenstates of the Hamiltonian are kind of special. Eigenstates of H are special. And the reason they're special is because of the, uh, the, the time-dependent Schrodinger equation here, it gets three stars. The time-dependent Schrodinger equation has H in it, right here, H. And that's what makes the Hamiltonian so special because it's in the time-dependent uh, Schrodinger equation. I mean, it, it could have been L, <laughs> it could have been S, but it's not, it's H. So that means H is special. So the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian are special. So here's the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, H uh, acting on some eigenstate of the Hamiltonian is going to be an energy, right, of the uh, Hamiltonian. Um, and so then if I can, if I know all of these eigenstates, then uh, I know that I can write um, the time dependence of a, of a wave function can be written in terms of the eigenstates. Um, uh, it's going to be, it's just, this is a formula that you guys all saw last semester. Uh, if you have the wave function at time t equals zero, then you overlap it onto the nth eigenstate and you multiply that times e to the, the phase factor. Uh, that's the time dependence of the, uh, of the eigenstate. And so I can write the time dependence of, of any wave function in terms of uh, a linear superposition of the eigenstates. Because if I have an eigenstate psi n of x, then I know that psi n of x t is equal to psi n of x times e to the negative i e n t over h bar. The time dependence of energy eigenstates is very simple. They just like a little arrow, they just have a little complex phase factor spinning. Um, um, and, and that allows me then to write the time dependence of any wave function as a linear in, in terms of a linear superposition over the energy eigenstates. Okay, so this is all review. So I'm kind of going over this fast. I'm assuming that you know you might not remember it so well, but You've all seen this. I know you did because you, you, you know, this is all part of 137A. Okay, so that's okay. So that's basically it. That, that's a review of 137A. Okay, so we just did quantum mechanics. <laughs> we just did 137A in like four minutes. That's pretty good. Okay, uh, and so now let's generalize all of this stuff 
it turns out that everything I just said generalizes, it all generalizes for more than one particle, for n greater than one, uh, where n equals the number of particles. So if we have more than one particle, then all of these concepts that I just mentioned generalize. They, they have to, because otherwise quantum mechanics would be useless. And if it didn't apply to multiple particles, then no one would care about it. So it turns out that it all applies to multiple particles. And, and what do I mean by that? So here's one particle. One particle is this, I have a box zero L, this is a box. My potential goes to infinity at the walls. By the way, I use particle in a box a lot. I, I think the particle in the box is like the nicest little quantum mechanics uh, example, it, you know, because it's so simple, you guys have all felt it. And so it, 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 if I have a particle in the box, it's here it is. Da, 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 da. Okay, so that's one particle in a box. And you guys all know how to do the quantum mechanics. You got that, you know, you got all the, Got the you know the n equals one. Got the oops, that was a bad drawing. You guys got the n equals two. You know you got the n equals three. Okay, so you guys have all done this before. You you guys know how the box works. So that's one particle in a box, and this is the quantum mechanics of it. But now what I want to talk about is n particles, okay? And um, for this case, for one particle, you guys all know that the eigenstates psi n of x are equal to square root of two over L sine, um, wow, let me get this off of my finger right here. Let's write it here. Psi n is equal to square root of two over L sine of n pi over L x. Okay, so that is the, the, and then you guys all know that the energy, you, I mean, you might not have this formula memorized, but you can all derive it. Uh, you all have derived it in the past over two m L squared. Okay, so that's particle in a box. But now we can do, we want to do that. What we want to do now is particle in a box for many particles. That's the, now the new thing is to do this, but for many particles. So now I want you to picture a box that has a bunch of particles. Okay, this is particle one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so here I have five particles and they're all bouncing around in that box. <clears throat> so, so now to describe this, to describe the quantum mechanics of this box with a bunch of particles in it, I need now to basically postulate that all the stuff I just said for one particle, it all works for, for, for more than one particle. And so, uh, if, so for quantum mechanics to work for many particles, then, then the quantum mechanics of many particles uh, for this to exist and to work, then I, then there has to be a wave function, right? So there, there, there must exist, there exists a wave function. I'll call it the many body wave function. Many body just means more than one particle. All right. Just that's, I just use that word many body, but there has to exist a wave function. And that wave function is going to be a, 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 a function of the position of all the particles. And then this wave function has to exist and <clears throat> it has to have a probabilistic interpretation. Otherwise it has no meaning. And so the probability, the probabilistic interpretation is gonna be that there's gotta be, there, there must exist a probability density, which is a function of the position of all those particles and that has to be the square, right? It has to be the square of it, x1, xn. Okay, so if I take the many body wave function and square it, you know, just using the same old math that you've always used before, 
then that squared wave function has to have a probabilistic interpretation. And that for that probabilistic for that probabilistic interpretation to make sense, then if I integrate from zero to infinity uh, over the position of particle one, particle two, particle three, particle n, if I integrate this function, x1, x2, x3, xn, then that integral that over all those variables has to equal what? Tell me. One. One. It has to, exactly. And so, and 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 similarly, <clears throat> I have to, there has to be a Schrodinger equation. The Schrodinger equation is the same. H psi is equal to IH bar DDT psi. It's got to all be the same, but now this is the many body wave function. Uh, and so that means that this has got to be the many body Hamiltonian. And so what is the many body Hamiltonian? So that means that there exists a many body Hamiltonian. And that many body Hamiltonian is going to be basically just the energy of all those particles. And I'm going to write, but before I write it down, I, I want to just make a point. And this might seem very trivial and stupid right now, but it's actually going to become more important and tricky later on. I just want to make the point that when we do quantum mechanics of many particles, all the particles have a number. So when I talk about particle one, it's a specific particle. And that particle is stamped with the number one on it. Particle two is stamped with the particle two. So these, so in order for me to write down the quantum mechanics of the particles, I have to be able to keep track of them mathematically. And I have to, in the, in the math, the part, I have to be able to tell one particle from the other, because you know, there's particle one, there's particle two, there's particle three. So from the, in, from the mathematics, the particles are always distinguishable in the sense that I can put a number on them to do the math. But some, but when we do an experiment and do a measurement, then often we cannot tell that, you know, when we do the measurement, we don't know which part, often we might not know which particle we see because they're indistinguishable. Uh, uh, but I just want to, but I don't, but let's, we will discuss this indistinct, the, the consequences of this indistinguishability of the particles turns out to have some very interesting consequences. But I don't want to get into those consequences now. I, uh, what I want to say to you is that from the from the uh, from from the uh, point of view of the mathematics, I can I'm putting I can put a number. I, I can distinguish the particles. I, the number particle one, particle two, particle three. Those numbers are labels, and the particles are stamped. Think of the particles as stamped with those labels. Okay. So so that means that when I write the many body Hamiltonian. That means that I can say, all right, the energy of that system of particles can, is going to be the kinetic energy of particle number one. If particle number one is stamped. And let's assume they all have the same mass. So I don't have to, so the notation doesn't get too horrible. And then I have the kinetic energy of particle two, etc., all the way to the nth particle. But then I also have um, the uh, potential energy of particle one, particle two, et cetera, particle n. So there's a potential energy of that system of particles. Um, and uh, I will also uh, state that all of these operators behave in the usual way. If I have uh, the commutator between say, uh, uh, I can write, I can write for example that P I is equal to H bar over I del, right? So, uh, and, and then I can say that um, um, if I have the commutator of the X position of particle one and the, uh, and the momentum of particle one, then that's gonna be equal to uh, well, let's write it like this. If, 
if I talk about the commutator between position and momentum, then we know that the commutator is IH bar. That's what you learned last semester. But now if I'm talking about multiple particles, I'm going to put a Kronecker delta there. Because if this, if this is the particle number, if that's, if that's particle number I, and if this is particle number J, then if I, then the, the position and momentum of different particles does commute. So if I have the position of particle one and the momentum of particle two, then those commute. It's only when I talk about the position and momentum of the same particle that they don't commute. And you know, think about that. That that's kind of a logical thing if you think about if you think it through. So this is sort of a, so these are sort of simple consequences of this whole many-body uh, approach. Um, and so then, um, so then also uh, I have a Hamiltonian. And then I can have uh, eigenstates. I can have many body eigenstates of the Hamiltonian, eigenstates of H, uh, the many body Hamiltonian. Because what I can do is I can say, um, I can say H, many body Hamiltonian acting on my, my uh, nth eigenstate. Uh, a many body eigenstate of, of my multiple particles is equal to En, the eigenvalue of that many body state. And so this is, and so this, this is the eigenstate, and this is the eigenvalue. Okay, just like before, it's just a very simple um, um, uh, uh, extrapolation. And I just want you to re be reminded, this is the position of particle number one, and this is the position of particle number two, and this is the position of particle number n. So that's what these different, different uh, 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 variables represent. Uh, and so then you can say that if I have an eigenstate, uh, suppose that my many body state psi, um, my, suppose that my many body wave function at t equals zero is equal to a known eigenstate psi n uh, of x1 all the way to xn, where, where this has some known uh, energy, then I know that my many body wave function at some time later, t greater than zero, is going to equal that same eigenstate, x1, xn, times what? Tell me. What is the time dependence of the many body energy eigenstate? Is it times the exponential to the power of minus I E N T? Exactly. Yeah. Because this is always true. This is that's right. And so remember, this is just a complex phase factor, right? It's just an arrow that spins along in the complex plane, right? This is my phase factor. I'm not drawing it very well, but you know, uh, phase factor. Right, so an, an eigenstate, the time dependence of an eigenstate is trivial. You have this complex phase factor that just spins and the rate at which it spins, the omega, it's spinning at some omega equals uh, E n over h bar. You know, it's spinning with some angular frequency. Okay, so th this is a picture that you already have from last semester. And I'm just telling you that the same thing is true for states, for many body states, where now I have the many body wave function and it has an energy and that wave function is also spinning around in some Hilbert space. And um, <clears throat> and so- uh, Can I clarify we, something, uh, Professor? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I was gonna ask, when we talk about the many body problem, are we referring only to an ensemble of the same type of particles? So for example, a whole bunch of electrons, 
or could it be, for example, electrons and neutrons in a box? Or something? Oh, it has to look. It has to be because, like, look at the hydrogen atom. I mean, I have a proton and an electron. I mean, they're different. I'm, you know, I'm just saying the quantum mechanics. Uh, like you could, you know, yeah, you have to be able to do it for different particles. Yes. Okay. So what we're doing here applies to different types of particles, then. Completely general. Great. It's completely Thanks. general. It's completely general. Um, I, I have a question. Dave. Yeah. Um, in this treatment, what's the significant? Is there any significance for the wave function of uh, a single particle? Oh yeah. Um, because um, what we've been doing in this treatment so far is that we have a wave function that's for the multi-body system, and any operator acting on that wave function is going to give us characteristics of the system that apply in general. So, for example, the potential energy of the system. So, let's say we wanted to find out how particle one is going to act in the system on its own. It definitely won't be independent um, and be acting like it would uh, without other particles being there. So how- oh, oh, let me, I, let me, I gotta stop you. The reason I'm stopping you, I, I normally I don't interrupt like this, but it's because we're, oh, we're over time. Mm -hmm. You know, it's after 11. So I, I have to, you know, I have to yeah, stop. Yeah. And so, cause I, but I'm gonna have my office hour. Uh, so I, I have to stop this so I can stop the recording and say the official lecture is over. And then I'll stop the recording and then I'll start back up again. So if you have time, we can discuss this, you know, for during office hour right now. But I will just give a quick comment that, you know, and there, I'm sorry for interrupting you. The only reason I'm doing this is because I got to stop, you know, because like normally, I, you know, I wouldn't do that. Uh, so a quick answer to your question is, yeah, of course, you know, the, the, prob the, the behavior of the individual particles is, is buried in that many body wave function. And that's what we're going to do next. We're going we're gonna to see how it reflects. So what we're going to do next, and then I'm going to finish this class. This is just so. What happens next? The question is, you know, uh, if we're suppose we're given the many-body Hamiltonian, okay, then what is uh, the many-body eigenstates? Okay, what are the many-body eigenstates, and what are the many-body eigenvalues? What are they? That, that's what we're going to figure out. And it's really easy, you know, uh, for certain situations. And, and, when, and when we do that, and we're going to do it, you know, uh, then, then you'll see that, that that will answer your question, okay? I think the, the answer to your question is just doing, is just solving, you know, for the many-body wave function, then you'll just see it, you know. Uh, okay, and that's where we'll stop. Uh, and so I'm going to stop now. I'm going to end the class. I end the, and then I'm going to start the recording. But then I'm going to start back up again for office hour. Uh, okay. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>